Airborne Ranger, Airborne Ranger, where have you been? Airborne Ranger, Airborne Ranger, where have you been? I've been around the... It's deactivation. And whereas recognized as the longest serving long range reconnaissance patrol ranger company in the United States Army history. The company traces its roots to 1961 when the 7th Army established the 5th Corps through 37th 79th Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol Company in Walflicken, Germany. Redesignated the following year as D Company, 17th Infantry Airborne upon its relocation to Frankfurt, Germany. The unit became A Company, 75th Rangers in 1968 at Fort Benning, Georgia, and whereas next transferred to Fort Hood, Texas in 1971, who the company initially assigned the 1st Armored Division and then became part of the 1st Cav Division in 1972, who uh, the unit was disbanded in December 19, 1974. That's when I had to leave. And most of its personnel were reassigned to the Ranger Battalion. I need to talk about to somebody about that. Whereas the members of A Company 75th Infantry garnered the lasting respect of their fellow service members for their professionalism and commitment to the highest ideals of the United States Armed Forces. And they may indeed reflect with pride on their contribution to the defense of the nation as they celebrate the noteworthy milestone. Now, therefore, be it recognized and resolved that today, the, on the 45th anniversary of the deactivation of the United States Army's A Company 75th Infantry Ranger be commemorated and by all those attending the unit's 2009, or 2019 reunion be extended sincere best wishes for a meaningful and memorable experience. Signed, Charles Doc Anderson, State Representative, 56th <coughs> District, Texas. Reverse it. Uh, reverse it. Reverse it. Turn it around. There you go. I think thank you. Thank you very much. I think they did a bad business. No, well. Thanks, fellas. I appreciate it. I think this is the last day. I think this is the second day in my life, maybe third, that I'm ecstatic. My wife says, Are you happy about that? I'm oh, ecstatic. Yeah. And she asked me about something if I'm happy. And my reply is, I'm ecstatic. But today, I'm ecstatic! <laughs> <laughs> Being part of A Company 75 was one of the greatest things in my life that happened. It taught me things that I never thought I would be able to accomplish and how to accomplish them. After A Company 75th, I went on another year or two in the military, got out, and became a real knucklehead on the back of a Harley Davidson. I'm married and doing what I wanted to. But I got scared away, wound up with a wife that knew how to tactically get me to become a real responsible person when she was next to me. <laughs> so Steve, will you stand up please? She, she's going to do it. All right, here's the story. Here's the story. I had a friend said, hey, I put your name in a hat. And a little while later, I got a call from some folks that said, how would you like to use some engineering and designing skills that you went to college for and do a, a real good thing. Said, okay, where's that? Afghanistan. Okay, I didn't even ask my wife permission. I just said, okay, I'll do a year. And then the year turned into two, and three, and four, in a place called Canada. Help my problems. Had some exciting things happen there. Went home, and then, about a year or so later, hey, there's an exciting place that we'd like to get you to do some work with. Okay, what? It's a place called Salerno, up on the Pakistan border. 
spell oh. muscle. Okay. Now, mind you, my wife never said no to me in that manner. <laughs> so I wound up in Salerno for about a year and a half. I don't know what to know about Salerno, but it's real, real challenging. Isn't it? The real thing is, I knew it was going to be my last time in the combat zone as a contractor or anybody or any other. So I did my year in plus when I was getting ready to go home. And I had an experience that happened to me. Us. Taliban, three days before I got ready to go home, Taliban threw me a going away party. They gave us a party every day, but this one was a going away party. They came at us from everywhere. Overruns, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. A couple of days after that, I really did get to go home, and I was standing outside one evening looking around, thinking. And I stood and I looked up at the flag, and I thought, Do you believe this? Looking at that flag, I thought, I cannot believe this. And by the way, I not only worked in the combat zone, no brag, but I was writing articles for newspapers on column back home. And they asked me, when you get ready to leave, your final article will be, what was it like in the combat zone. And I'm standing there looking at that flag that evening. And I thought, how can I tell this story that they're asking me to tell? And I was I was bump I looked at the flag and said, you represent a country that people give their lives to for others that they don't even know. How can I tell this story to civilians in a college? And then I had, I had a conversation with God. Okay, like it's up to you. Duh. Believe it or not, I went back in my pool, sat down, and checked this out. I had composed before, but this is not me. Not the way I usually do it. And this was the composure that came to me that I put in that archive. If glory could speak, the American flag, if glory could speak, what would she say? Would she tell the story of freedom and the pain she felt along the way? My coat is run red with blood and white stripes of purity that surrounds a field of blue which beds the stars of unity. If we could speak, I fly from points on high for all the world to see, representing a country of liberty and those who fight to keep it free. If glory could speak, I stand with those who raise their hands in open to answer the call and take the caskets of the fallen from the battlefield who gave their all. I'm displayed in many ways and places draped in halls and home walls and sometimes painted on faces. But the grandest spot where I could be is in your heart with great emotion which sheds a tear for me. The glory can speak. What would she say of the freedom and the 
she's been a long time. I have a few presentations I would like to pass on. I kind of put together a black thing you know, with a few folks I'd like to recognize. If I could, I'll wait till they get through. Saturday 7th. Yeah, I got a few stories of my own while I'm over there. I'm a tear gas here in the mm -hmm. It came time for being a listener. So I went to my commander, Captain Ross, and said, I want to go over there. He said, Are you going to go over there? That's a company sent me get over there. Those guys are not normal. <laughs> So that's exactly what I want to be, not normal. <laughs> he said, don't, don't we enlist for the union. I'm going to go talk to somebody. So he went to talk to somebody. And I got transferred, and then shortly after, I went to Airborne and Ranger School. My company commander set that up. Do you know what it's like? He gave me a situation where Right away, I had some good challenges that would build me into challenging character. He sent me 
to ranger school as a leg and to airborne school as a leg ranger. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Don't go away. Don't not go away. So, he was an inspiration to me. He was an inspiration to all of us. I'm going to tell you, he gave us inspiration to accomplish and go after what we want in life and go and don't quit and get it. As a matter of fact, I can think of one real neat example that included the officer's club and a jukebox. <laughs> he administrated his technical skills with his right foot until the jukebox quit playing and then he administrated a whole roll of quarters into playing music that he wanted to hear. Am I wrong? <laughs> God bless you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Everybody, uh, for those of you who don't remember me, uh, I came with the unit uh, in uh, September of 69 and brought the unit to Fort Hood in January of 70 and left there in March of 1973. So a lot of you probably don't know who I am. There are a few that do. Uh, I don't know if Horton's around. Horton was around. A few others were around. Some other guys started more. Staff Sergeant Solomon Powell. Some of you probably remember him. I've seen him when you guys were on the Forger. I was also in, I was in Germany at that time. And we all had the Forger 73. So uh, I was assigned to the 8th Medical Battalion Airborne at that time. And uh, he came to see me. And uh, so, uh, excuse me. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, I can pull it myself here a little bit. You guys were the best. Time, you were my savior. When I came back to Vietnam. Like a lot of you, I had a lot of issues. But this company and everybody in it helped me get through it. Couldn't have done it. And any of you, I couldn't have got where I was in the Army. Retired as a master sergeant, but you all are the ones that got me there. I couldn't be more proud to be here today. I've been looking for a lot of you guys for a long time. And thanks to Doc Penner, a good friend of mine. Told me about this. I got a hold of it. And there I am. And I want to thank you for allowing me this time to thank all of you, especially to my wife Megan for helping get me here. I can't drive very far. Thanks to all the company, all those, all those damn airplanes. <laughs> but I'm here. I would go anywhere for any of you guys. Till the day I die. That's all I got. It's been fun. With no mustache? 
No hair, about 135 pounds, what do you expect? <laughs> I didn't want to take too long, but I've been serving since I got off active duty, since about uh, 1979. Um, still am. Is this thing on? That one? Yeah. Oh, you got that? Yeah. yeah. I'm not too technical. Uh, I just wanted to tell you guys something. Um, I've been operating, not to sound boastful, uh, at pretty senior levels everywhere except Australia for the last 45 years. And everywhere I go, my colleagues and all of the three letter agencies that we are asked to help out from time to time consistently come to me and tell me that all they need to know is that a guy's a ranger and they'll take him. So you should be proud of that. Thanks for letting me serve with y'all. Hey, they're going to keep on ticking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's history. I, I need to remind the Rangers here about your position at Fort Hood. Everywhere on that reservation you went, and even clean everywhere, there were, there, everyone honors that damn back away. They might not say it, they might look at you weird, they might walk away, but they look at that parade, and, and, that, and that Ranger tells them everyone came, and you, you were just awesome for them. Most of the time, they have nothing to say. The ones that did, it didn't, was, was words of confidence and words of pride. And then along came our Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Army, Eric Shinsiki. Eric Shinsiki that took our black away away. Yeah. Yeah, everybody. I mean, he had a reason for that, but I don't know what it was. So anyway, the Rangers became defeated for a while, and all of a sudden, come up to my fellow parade. But it was still the same, same insignia, that, that parade. We had a Ranger tag and a Ranger signet for it, carried the parade. Okay, to change the subject, I got to tell you a real quick short story, a true story, about Camp Pumas, an operation, tactical operation at Camp Pumas, that's outside of San Somehow or other, uh, during the jump, somehow or other during the jump, uh, <laughs> I, I still have mine at home, I didn't find it. So some guy doing a jump, a man named Deagle, uh, got rocked and got, got uh, this cherry jumper. And he come under me, and I got away, and come over, come over me, and that's my shoe collapse. Got my legs. You needed to say, all the rangers in that area helped me get off my rucksack, they got off my gear, they got off my parachute. And Captain Nolan, thank God for him, he called that same chopper back and picked me up. And our senior medics, there I saw the ground, put my head in traction. It was shattered, four, five, six, or seven, four, it was shattered. He kept me in traction all the way to the emergency room, pulled my head hard. So if it wasn't for Captain Nolan and Stanford Brown, but all the Rangers took my gear off, I would not be here today. I swear to God I wouldn't be here. So they called in a specialist from Fort Moore, we need to do the operation, and took the bone down my hip, and put it in my neck. So therefore, I can never be accused of having my head in my ass. My ass in my head! Can you hear me without this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. That was a little bit. I asked if I could share a little bit about uh, probably one of the guys that you all, I don't know you all know, that's the epitome of a ranger, and that's John Kennedy. Uh, <laughs> share his story of how his accident happened and how he died in the helicopter crash. But first, I want to just say that uh, when I left the Rangers, I went to school after Fort Hood, I went recruiting, got out of the Army, I had a five-year break in service. And during that five-year break in service, I worked two years as special assistant to Senator Jeremiah Denton. Remember, 
he was the first field levy that got off the plane on uh, Clark Air Force Base. And I told people that Gary, seven years and seven months with the POW, and he's asked to make a speech there at Clark Air Force Base, and he says, we are honored to be able to have served our country under difficult circumstances. He just called seven years and seven months of POW experience, four years in solitary confinement as an opportunity and an honor. So I've always felt uncomfortable when somebody comes up to me and says, thank you for your service. And I go, okay, well, thank you. So I've added that. I, I now say thank you. It was an honor to serve. But I took what he said and I've added to it. And it comes out a little bit better for me. I don't feel like, I, I'm not sure what their purpose is thanking me is, but I just want them to know that I was honored to be able to serve, and serve with guys like you. Uh, story about John. <laughs> Y'all wrong for that. <laughs> the story about John Kennedy, uh when I came back in the Army, John and I both ended up at Fort Benny. I was the battalion commander of first the 18th Infantry. He was oh, the battalion no. commander of the 3rd <coughs> Ranger Battalion. No, 3rd, excuse me. 3rd Ranger Battalion. <coughs> and uh, he, the 1st Ranger Battalion had a chain of command and they were in Fort Stewart, on our Army Air Force. So their new commander had not been on doing any kind of exercise and everything. So they had an exercise plan to getting certified as a thing. That's the way they were doing it back then. The problem was, John was not supposed to be on that exercise. He was, it's real hard for his wife, Barb, because the night before John left to go on that exercise, they were club, and the guy that was supposed to be on that exercise was the Ranger Executive Officer, the Ranger Regiment Executive Officer. He walked by and he said something to him about, about the exercise. And John said, you know, I'm not supposed to be on that exercise. You are. And the guy kind of flipped him and said, yeah, I know. Well, that's the bar. That's stuck in her mind about how he was put and this, this other guy was supposed to go. And he got to They were out at the great end of Utah doing an exercise across the great on the lake, three Air Force helicopters. It was an Air Force rescue helicopter, rescue squadron that was being certified to be a special operations. So they used this exercise to certify them. The problem was the squadron commander of that Air Force squadron decided he was going to fly and took co-pilot out of his seat, put him behind him, and then squadron commander was the second guy. He never flown with the other guy, so they were in there. Uh, it was really bad weather when it started, and the 160th had two little birds that went out first to recon, and when they got out there, got over the they aborted the mission, and they called to the Air Force, the man 130 of us says abort. The weather's too bad. It never transmitted that back down to the ground to the three helicopters. Well, they took off. John and first battalion commander, fifth battalion commander, and the Air Force squadron commander were all in the same aircraft. Uh, and they were the third aircraft. And as they were going across the lake, the first two helicopters finally decided to board. And when they did, the only person that survived out of that crash was the pilot. Anything you want to, I'm recording all of this. Well, it's good to see you. I am very, very blessed to have been able to serve with all of you Rangers. It was my honor. And a great company of people it was. And it still is today. All we got to do is get together and it's like 45 years just that it was yesterday. We've had fun.
and we'll have some more before the day's out. Oh. Had a good time. Then some leg gets up and goes up and asks her to come down and dance. And she's a nice girl, so she comes down, but she, he's dancing with my girl. So I just, as they were dancing, I just got up and got in between him and her, and I just got back dancing. And I, I felt the swing for it came, and as he swung, all my buddies just the place erupted. And I remember I think it was Bane, and I want to say Tom. They were just standing in the door. They blocked the door, and there was a, and they 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 anyway after that little fight, and we got out of there. It turns out the guy that was um, that took a swing at me was getting out that day, and somebody broke his jaw, and so he had to stay. It felt bad about that. But, but that's when we remember we had to stay up. The, everybody was confined to that attic. We played a lot of peanut up there until we got out that day. That's what I remember. But yeah, Almarez and I would do anything, anywhere. <laughs> in the morning, and uh, we were out the back parking lot as always, but we formed up and we. This bad land right about the door door going into the company. And we're wiggling around and going on and a couple of guys, we finally got a big stick and got in his mouth because he's swallowing his tongue. He got his tongue back out of his throat. Well it turned out uh, when we got down out to the hospital, uh, he had a softball sized mass in his head. And uh, Dan got evacuated back to his home city of Decatur, Georgia. And then I, about that time, I turned the company over and went to the dance course with Dan. And I visited Dan uh, right before he passed away there in Decatur. Uh, his wife and two twin daughters that he had. And uh, I'll just tell you, uh, cancer is not the way to go. No. Uh, I, I'm not going to describe what I saw, but I, I just felt very, very sorry, not only for Dan, but for to see him in that kind of condition because I, I remember him as a very strapping MCO in the, the ranch company. Uh, but the end of the story was good news because the guy from A75 paid the wrong way to come to the cater to put down work. And I thought that was a great thing that uh, we were able to carry Dan's casket and uh, be there with his family from the company. Thank you all very much. Cecil Brooks, Alan Campbell, Mark Carlisle, Desiderio Chavez, Alan Childress, Robert Crepe, Thomas Davis, Robert Dornball, Kenneth Easton, Albert Eller, Douglas Farr, Thomas Gregg, Richard Herman, Marvin Hogue. Harvey Gerald, John Keneally, Miles, Miles Knight, Alphonsus Marlowe, Philip Meads, 
Richard Moreau. Howard Marie. Edward Nichols. William Nolan. Monty Overaken. Christopher Platt. James Rush. Dennis Scott. Daniel Sibylla. Thomas Schaefer. Mad Dog Shriver. Dane Smith. Neil Smith. Jimmy Thomas. John Ariba. Albert Watson. Miles Webb. Floyd White. Dwayne Wilkes. Thomas Latruba. Ronald Ubarra. Curtis Young. This time, if you'd render honors to Taps. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention and your reverence. Please enjoy the rest of the day here at the Ranger Reunion. Yes, you may. Absolutely. It looks like an airborne shuffle to me. I, uh, I just want to say this uh, one thing. Uh, being Rangers and stuff, I want you to understand that uh, very little information that has known, but in uh, 2008, they passed a House bill where all veterans, active duty, and people that were veterans in the Army surrendered the hand salute from now on. Now, I'm a UIL volleyball referee for high school and middle school in the state of Texas. And when all the other referees are putting their hands over their heart, I render the hand salute because the Congress said, because we're veterans, mm -hmm. and it was put out specifically to separate veterans from the regular people. So from, from now on, when everybody asks me, why did I render the hand salute? I just tell them I was a ranger, yeah. and it makes all the difference in the world. So I know we're more patriotic than most of the people in America. So instead of putting our hands over our heart, uh, Congress gave us that right to render the hand salute. And as Rangers, I think it would be proper for all of us to render the hand salute whenever, wherever we go, whenever we hit the Pledge of Allegiance or any other uh, honors being given to the uh, uh, American people, we render the hand salute. I do, because I'm a Ranger. And I think everybody else should start initiating that to, uh, set, you know, to separate everybody from the people who have never served, okay? That's all I have to say. Hey, hey, Captain Jack. Hey, hey, Captain Jack. Meet me down by the railroad track. Meet me down by the railroad track. With that weapon in my hand. With that weapon in my hand. I'm going to be a shooting man. I'm going to be a shooting man. Hey, hey, Captain Jack. Hey, hey, Captain Jack. Meet me down by the railroad track. Meet me down by the railroad track. With that 60 in my hand. With that 60 in my hand. I'm going to be a gunner man. I'm going to be a gunner man.